Hi everybody, yeah, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Teresa Ong. Uh, Dr. Ong is an agroecologist and assistant professor of environmental studies at Dartmouth. She got there by way of a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Michigan, followed by an NSF postdoctoral fellowship at Princeton. Uh, Dr. Ong has published widely in mathematical ecology, including um, or theoretical ecology, including mathematical aspects of transitions between systems, including, for example, from conventional agriculture to agroecological forms of farming. She's also interested in urban gardens and in Chinatowns, which is what she'll be talking to us about today. And in addition to Dr. Ong's extremely interesting scholarship, or really is part of it, uh, she's working on building a lab which will become a model of diversity, inclusion and equity in the field. And she's also been involved in some much needed climate activism. So I'm really happy that Dr. Ong has accepted our invitation to talk and I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to say. So over to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. So hello and thank you for the invitation to speak with you all. I'm very excited to be sharing this work that is still very much at its initial stages and can use a lot of input and feedback. We started this project thinking about Chinatowns as alternative food networks. And I'll explain what I mean by alternative in a bit. But first, I want to acknowledge the incredible team of people who I am working with on this project. This project is the brainchild of several people, including Valerie and Bruce, whose thesis work and book from Farm to Canal Street inspired conversations Talia Young and I had while reading it as postdocs at Princeton. That's where we started working with grad student Wajin Yang and brought the project to Dartmouth where my undergrad student Safia Thanapin and research assistant uh, Alana Danu are now working on. So we are excited to work on this new project on Chinatowns as alternative food networks. And when we say alternative, we are acknowledging that currently global food systems are in crisis. Agriculture, forestry, and other land use contributes 23% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which are warming up the planet and making it more difficult to farm without risk. Those greenhouse gases are associated with increased use of chemical fertilizers. A 500% increase has occurred just over the last 50 years, most of which is running off into nearby waters, causing marine hypoxic zones and also reducing remaining natural phosphorus reserves, which are expected to peak just 10 years from now in 2030. Land itself is massively converted to agriculture, Roughly 65% um, has changed from 1961 uh, to 2011. And with all the associated biodiversity that is lost with those forests and other natural systems being converted to agriculture, agriculture itself is greatly simplifying so that we have now lost 75% of all crop diversity just over the last century. So most of these impacts of agriculture result from management styles. Here I am presenting two major forms of agriculture that are often pitted against one another, conventional and agroecological systems. Conventional agricultural systems rose to prominence during the green revolution of the 1960s when new highly productive hybrid seed varieties were grown in monoculture to increase yields. This required extensive application of agrochemicals and the use of machinery, which were new technologies that had large impacts on increasing productivity. These so-called conventional systems tended to be large scale production systems that sold products at international scales and focused primarily on cash crops like tobacco, uh, sugar, and commodities like rice, wheat, and corn. Agroecological farms, in contrast, dominated agriculture for much of human history and still do to some extent today. These systems are typified by polyculture production, which is the growth of many types of crops on a single farm. Imports are um, largely replaced by labor um, and production is usually much smaller in scale. Production in agroecological farms is sold primarily at local scale community markets and used for subsistence of farmers and farm workers themselves. 
So it is interesting to see how these two alternative management styles have performed in the wake of COVID-19. The pandemic shook global food systems with many reports in the US of food systems both failing and improving due to the pandemic. While large scale milk and egg manufacturers famously struggled to find markets and allowed produce to rot or drain away, people also started to rediscover local food systems and to some extent uh, shift by preferencing local farmers and reconnecting with home gardening. So Chinatowns are not typically considered in discussions on food systems, which I think is a real shame considering that they on the surface exemplify by many of the key features that are considered to be agroecology. A read of Valerie in Bruce's book, From Farm to Canal Street, shows how New York Chinatown farms are overwhelmingly diverse polyculture production systems that rely heavily on labor and local small scale community networks for its maintenance. So these systems are also globally replicated, making them very interesting for research. Wherever you go, you seem to be able to find a Chinatown. And though each Chinatown was born out of unique social and historical events, they all seem to arrive in similar hubs of social, economic, and cultural connectivity, which are centered around Chinese cuisine. So reading in Bruce's book fascinated me and my colleagues who wanted to ask questions regarding the network structure of Chinatowns and whether there was something unique about the social connections in the food supply chain that could, could be responsible for their global replication and historical perseverance over time. These questions were formulated before the pandemic, but COVID-19 has placed extreme stress on food systems, not least of which include Chinatowns because of the heightened intensity of xenophobia, particularly centered around dubious connections between exotic Asian foods and zoonotic disease. COVID-19 is an unwelcome shock to Chinatown that has occurred amidst an ongoing and escalating fight against gentrification and land use competition in Manhattan. We want to know uh, whether the network structure of Chinatown might impart any resilience to these, um, these past and current uh, shocks. Relatedly, we are interested in how the agrobiodiversity of Chinatowns is related to this network structure. Is competition between vendors selling varied products somehow responsible for um, the agrobiodiversity of Chinatowns? And relatedly, what will happen to that agrobiodiversity if vendors are removed from the supply chain? Recall that we've already lost 75% of global agrobiodiversity and losing more poses significant risks for food insecurity and nutritional deficits, especially for marginalized populations, which Chinatowns disproportionately serve. So our methods include a mix of techniques, including data analysis of existing data from in Bruce's um, book, and also collecting new data and some systems modeling. Here I'm outlining our larger goals for the project, which included data analysis of the structure of Chinatown social network and analysis of the agrobiodiversity network um, and to compare the social network to its biodiversity network to see if one can reasonably predict the other with any accuracy. The reason for this is we predict that the social network is in many ways linked to competition uh, between vendors for a diversity of crops and products for sale in Chinatown. So to address this question, we are creating a model of competition between vendors based on supply demand dynamics of available products and the costs associated with various market strategies. So with this dynamic systems model, we also induce shocks in order to assess impacts on coexistence of vendors and products. So shocks include decreases, um, for example, in the demand for products broadly or a selective reduction of certain products and also disruptions that might only apply to particular, uh, particular sized vendors. As we know, COVID-19 seems to be impacting um, uh, vendors of different sizes differently. 
So we are just getting started on this project. Uh, and for today, I will show you some results regarding these highlighted areas here, um, beginning with the analysis of the Chinatown social network. So uh, Dr. and Bruce interviewed distributors and farmers in 2003 uh, to six using semi-structured interviews to collect quantitative and qualitative answers to how distributors and farmers were connected in Chinatown. So these are examples of her questions here, including how long have you been selling Asian vegetables? How do you deal in Asian fruits and vegetables, et cetera? And, um, and Bruce uh, used these answers to the questions to produce the social network here, which were color coded by the type of relation each node, um, which is a farmer or distributor in the network, has with their primary contact in the network. So the conclusion here was that Chinatown's social network appears to be heavily conserved. Um, Dr. and Bruce found that 62% of people in the network maintain previous relationships, including employment, friendship, and many kin relationships. So Dr. and Bruce suggests that this insular nature of Chinatown may be partly responsible for its integrity over the years, allowing patrons to um, operate both outside of, but also because of deals that allowed smaller Chinatown proprietors to take advantage of the broader US food supply chain architectures that are currently dominated by larger scale conventional operations at this time. So our team was interested in analyzing the structure of this network, which we did by calculating degree distributions and other typical network statistics. So degrees refer to the total number of edges of a single node, where a node is a dot in the social network. And um, we can see, uh, so, uh, a node is a dot in the social network and each actual connection between the nodes is, is called an edge. So um, by calculating the number of um, connections for each node, we can see uh, the degree distribution. And here on this graph, you can see that most nodes in the network have one to three connections and very few have greater than nine. So um, looking at all of the different nodes, we find that node labeled DG underscore FL, uh, highlighted with a heart here, has the highest connectivity. And that's a statistic we call betweenness. Um, this node represents the center of the only statistically significant um, cluster that we found in the network. So we wanted to compare Chinatown's network structure to classic forms of networks in the literature, like random, small world, and scale-free networks. So random networks include random connections between all of the nodes, um, while small world networks are the result of the so-called seven degrees of separation that presumably exists between every other person in the world. So the idea here is that social networks have a tendency to belong in small interconnecting groups, which is where the phrase, it's a small world after all comes from. So in contrast, uh, scale-free networks have nodes that are linked hierarchically. So the structure repeats itself based off of simple rules like branching. And, and that creates a structure that is similar at every scale, hence scale-free. So we simulated random networks with these underlying structures uh, and compared them to the empirical Chinatown network. And we found that Chinatown social network in orange, um, labeled empirical here, has a degree distribution that most closely aligns to the scale-free structure, yeah, the teal line here. So, uh, when we plot a scale-free degree distribution on a log-log scale graph, uh, we get a linear relationship, the slope of which is referred to as the scaling parameter. So values typically range between one and three for the scaling parameter, and those that are closer to three are thought to indicate a greater degree of hierarchical scaling, um, where you have even fewer highly connected nodes than you might anticipate. So we see that Chinatown's scaling parameter is 1.28, which may indicate less of a hierarchy, 
um, though it is still a scale-free structure. And that scale-free structure may itself indicate that Chinatowns are in some ways structured for efficiency, uh, a trait that may be representative of many food chains, although we haven't yet really compared Chinatown's uh, network structure to other food supply chains, which we hope to in the future um, to, to say something more about this. So Dr. and Bruce surveyed the, also surveyed the species composition of farms that, um, that grow for Chinatown markets in 2006. And she found an impressive diversity of species, including upwards to 40 species on any given farm. Uh, we wanted to see whether this high degree of polyculture production could result from the supply demand competitive dynamics with the vendors. And so Luo Jun Yang, a Princeton graduate student, spearheaded the development of a competition model uh, with me, which tracks the total revenue M of an ith competitor in Chinatown that is based simply on the social network uh, PIJ here, which is a matrix that connects every possible um, vendor to every possible product. Um, and the abundance is AIJ of each vendor I and product J which will track those abundances, track changes in the price and the overall means cost for the vendors. So we assume that prices are determined by demand uh, and production costs, D and C. So vendors are also constrained by the total maintenance costs for holding products for sale, uh, which we assume saturates based on the abundance in stock. Um, so in this case, bulk vendors have to pay less per item. Vendors have an advantage then if they stock up on those um, items, on lots of items. And we don't show this here, but specials have uh, reduced production costs because they only sell one type of product and so are seen to have less um, costs for just specializing on that product. So we started with a simple two by two case uh, to example potential competitive effects. And you can see if you just have two merchants selling two different types of products, there's a variety of different ways in which you can connect them. So here merchants M1 and M2 are selling all products A1 and A2. In this case, uh, M2 is a generalist, uh, but M1 sells only product A1. Here, merchant one is the generalist and it's just flipped. And in this case, they are both specialists. So in simulations of um, the all connected scenario, uh, the revenue for each of the merchants, it seems will depend on how much each product the, uh, the merchant sells and of course the supply and demand of those products. And this is just a good check to see that our, our model is working as we would anticipate. So when M1 is the generalist um, and M2 is the specialist, it can outcompete that specialist if that specialist product is not particularly in demand. And that's kind of what you would expect as well. So when there are two specialists, they um, can also coexist so long as each product has a market. And that also makes sense. So in general, if the merchants are both generalists or specialists, they can coexist pretty easily by uh, specializing on their own products or being um, exactly the same and sharing the market. Whereas in the case where one is a generalist and the other is a specialist, coexistence of the vendors and the products is really dependent on the demand of each product and the production costs. Um, which can favor the specialists under specific scenarios, but in general would favor the generalists. But what happens um, if a vendor or product disappears from the market? And that's what we're interested in now because of uh, COVID-19's impacts on, on Chinatowns. And a team of scholars at NYU led by Stella Yi uh, is investigating uh, COVID-19 closures in New York, Chinatown and other neighborhoods. And they call this the co-closed study. 
the team um, compared Manhattan's Chinatowns to other neighborhoods in Manhattan that included minority communities in East Harlem and predominantly white um, wealthy communities in the Upper East Side. And then they compared uh, this group of um, communities to uh, comparative Brooklyn communities where you had Chinese minority and white communities in Sunset Park, Brown, uh, Brownsville and Park Slope. And so um, with their team, they did internet and in-person checks of all of the um, restaurants, retail stores and produce centers in these uh, communities to see if uh, if those um, businesses were still operating and if they had um, closed permanently or temporarily. They have documented much higher rates. Um, the conclusion was that there were much higher rates of indefinite and temporary closures in Chinatown and Chinese communities in Brooklyn as compared to white and other minority communities in Manhattan and Brooklyn. So you can see those results here. And this is uh, true for restaurants, which are pictured here. And you have a map on the right here showing uh, which uh, restaurants were closed in red. Um, and to a lesser extent, but still apparent for retail stores in this case, and then um, very much so for produce vendors, which Chinatown and Sunset Park are really well known for. We can see that New York Governor Cuomo's New York on pause policy is kind of like a universal perturbation to the food industry in New York because everyone is affected by the closures. But um, other perturbations could target specific groups of, uh, or individual products. For instance, if uh, racism is, is particularly affecting um, the production of so or the selling of so-called exotic Asian foods. Um, so to understand the effects of this, uh, these different types of perturbations, we modeled universal and unilateral perturbations at time step 500 in our simulations here. And to do this, we uh, reduce demand of um, either both products or just product A1. Um, so we found that in a one specialist, one generalist scenario, the generalist does better in this universal perturbation um, where both products are affected by being able to switch to alternative products while the specialist merchant two suffers. So note here that um, once we reduce demand, the perturbation is permanent and uh, for the remainder of the simulation. And so the increase in Merchant One's revenue uh, later on in the simulation is because it's able to switch to, um, to another product. So in a unilateral perturbation where only product one demand is reduced, the generalist Merchant One can still recover by switching products and competing for the remaining available um, market of product A2 with, with a specialist. So since in both of these scenarios, the generalist seems to have an advantage, we take these results as supporting the general ecological conclusion that in a highly variable or uncertain environment, and in this case, that's markets, we would expect generalists to outcompete specialists. We also, uh, can expand our model to include M possible merchant selling N possible crops. So to start with, we simulated 40 merchants that were selling a maximum of 100 um, products from farms with a mean of 19 crops. This is based off of data in Bruce collected in uh, 2003 to four. So based off of in Bruce's data, we also simulated merchants um, so that they tend to have non overlapping crops. That is, they were pre predominantly specialist um, merchants. Then we uh, randomly reduced demand by 80% to 30% of the crops at time step 2500. So here on the bottom right, you can see uh, the abundances of crops drop at that time. And on the bottom left, uh, you see the impact on the merchant's revenues. So here, uh, degree indicates how much of a generalist the merchant is. So the purple lines are specialists. The more purple you are, the more specialist you are. And in contrast to our two by two scenario, it seems here that the generalists are rebounding better in this expanded scenario after the perturbation. 
So note, just as before in our last simulation, we never increase the demand after it drops. So generalists are improving because they are switching to the better products, whereas the specialists are constrained by how many products that they, they um, can have access to. So if we uh, simulate a normal distribution for the number of crops each merchant sells, we can assess the impact of having more generalists in Chinatown. So here we show this new distribution on the top two graphs, uh, indicating the probability distribution of merchants and crops given the number of crops per merchant. And, and below we have graphed the resulting effects on merchant revenues um, when the abundance of crops is forced to decline, as you can see here in the lower right again. So this case is interesting because fewer of the um, merchants seem to survive the perturbation compared to the specialist scenario, which was modeled to more closely resemble what vendors actually look like in Chinatown. But keep in mind that we are just in the exploring phase of this model uh, exercise, this modeling exercise. And so just based on uh, these first preliminary results we have in this competitive um, um, expanded scenario with 30, 40 merchants, it seems like specialists may actually be able to help maintain higher numbers of vendors in Chinatowns. Um, so I think it's important um, while asking questions about whether and how Chinatowns will respond to perturbations in the present and future um, to remember its past. So Chinatowns were born out of a history of racism in the US that kept Chinese immigrants from coming, staying and making a living in the US for many years, starting in 1882 in the US uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, um, the first and pretty much only um, act to specifically call out a, a race to, to prevent from coming into the country. Uh, only the last of which of these laws, which were, were uh, finally repealed uh, just a few decades ago in 1967. And um, these laws also uh, forced Chinese people to work in the food industry. Um, and many argue that this uh, intense racially motivated exclusion of Chinese people are in some ways responsible for Chinatown's overwhelming resilience from outside influence. And it remains to be seen how Chinatown will respond uh, given the new pressures that the COVID-19 pandemic poses. So this work is just beginning and we hope to expand its scope in the near post COVID future to assess coordinate um, food insecurity impacts and also to resample agrobiodiversity of a potentially altered Chinatown social network. We want to also uh, impose different network structures on our competition model in order to link uh, competitive dynamics between vendors ultimately uh, to old and new social network um, and agrobiodiversity data. So we hope to understand whether standing in a Chinatown market, counting the diversity of products that a particular vendor and her neighbor sells has anything to do with their social ties or social connections and whether there are particular vendors or connections we should seek to preserve in order to help preserve the overall agrobiodiversity in Chinatown. So with that, I just wanna thank uh, and acknowledge the incredible team of people responsible for the co study that continues today and is led by this inspiring team of people. Um, and also to thank all of you for your attention today. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll gladly answer them. Thank you very much, Dr. Ong. That was fascinating. Um, and we do have some questions coming in. So I'll start with the first one from Alec Armstrong. Um, okay, just need a second to digest this. So how might settlement patterns arising from more recent or future patterns of emigration and investment compared to the Chinatown template, especially in sub-Saharan Africa? Will these areas develop different food networks and how might growing infrastructure links to China, like One Belt, One Road, affect food distribution options in historical Chinatowns? And how might that affect source agrobiodiversity? And let me know if you need any of that again. Wow, that's a really interesting question and a really important question. I think it's really important to consider the effects of these new immigration uh, trends um, 
And we see it, in, I think in Chinatown, it's interesting because there are satellite Chinatowns in, if we're looking at New York or other cities. Um, but there, uh, so there are new trends where people are moving into different neighborhoods and the old Chinatowns maybe being an older um, collection of people and communities. Um, <clears throat> But at the same time, there are similarities in terms of um, Chinatowns sort of being the major hub for, um, um, for welcoming these new immigrants, right? A lot of um, uh, new immigrants from different countries that don't have um, English as their primary language or maybe haven't developed yet those English skills, they tend to uh, go first to uh, Chinatown or other immigrant neighborhoods, depending on where they are from. Um, and so that is still happening in these, these, new, uh, these new suburbs, but the communities are different. You're also getting second generation, third generation Chinese Americans with different um, backgrounds and different economic um, interests. And so that's really changing and gentrifying the neighborhoods. Um, but at the same time, they see themselves as very distinct from other, other communities coming into Chinatown. Um, so you have the second generation Chinese Americans sort of fighting against the tide of other people trying to um, change Chinatown and make it into the next Soho. Hey, thank you. Um, actually, I have a question. And when you were talking, you, you mentioned numerous times generalists and specialists and competition and all these terms made me think of ecological modeling. And then at some point I realized, hang on, is she using an ecological model or an economic model? And is there a difference? Can, can you say more about the kinds of models that are used in those very different fields and how much overlap and divergence there is? Yeah, so I think, so everyone has like a subset of tools in which they draw upon and which, uh, but, and, and my tools have always been ecological. And so I have always gravitated toward um, ecological tools for understanding um, interactions between organisms and their environment. And for me, I feel like everything is an organism interacting with its environment. And at that scale um, has that applicability to, um, to everything. Although when we approach modeling, we, we try to uh, think more about the first principles of the system, like what exactly is driving the um, driving the, uh, the the effects that we're observing, right? And trying to see whether those um, hypothesize effects when uh, written out in equations actually produce the result that we anticipate. And so in that way, I think that you can use an ecological model the same way that you use an economic model. Although uh, the reasons why they're so distinct are because they have different goals, um, whether it's like predicting a specific uh, set of outcomes in a specific place or um, you know, predicting markets for, for a specific group of people to take advantage of, um, or if it's about understanding the underlying reasons for, for observing the trends that you do. All right, thank you. That's very thought provoking. So um, let's see, another kind of long question from Quentin Reed. Um, so he says, one thing he'd like you to discuss is how transient the dynamics were of the post-COVID crunch in food demand. He says he was surprised at how quickly Big Ag was able to recover and adjust different patterns of demand caused by the pandemic. Is that because some of those large producers, although specialized, have more financial resources, including external subsidies that help them pivot? And is that something that you could include in the model? Yeah, I do think that that's definitely true. We see that um, in many cases with stress in agriculture, that if you have the funds to, um, to help you recover, that's going to give you a great boost and great advantage. And I think that's also a general sort of phenomenon um, in ecology too. If you have more resources, you can, uh, you can make it through the tough times more easily. Um, as to whether those trends were transient in terms of the food system. I think, you know, food is so, um, so essential, right, to our lives that, that basically 
the industry was forced to change in order to make it to make it work. And I, I don't know uh, if we have enough data yet and analysis yet to know what the long term impacts on the food system are. And that's something I think people will be studying for many years into the future. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we have another question about small businesses versus large businesses from Merle Eisenberg. Um, do you see differences in the way that small versus larger businesses think about economics and how they promote their businesses? Are there examples in which maximizing profits is profit is less central than, say, creating communal cohesion or other things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's also often a narrative we see in uh, the comparison of conventional versus agroecological systems. The idea that um, farmers from these different types of uh, management systems, they have uh, different um, outcomes that and goals that they're balancing, different needs that they're balancing. And so where um, a bigger firm or conventional farm might prioritize uh, economic profit, there are other things that a farmer um, needs and, and uses in terms of the farm, whether that farm is used for preserving their culture, whether it's used for passing on their traditions to the next generation. Those things are really important to people and um, can change the way that they manage the farm uh, and decide like what is, is the best path forward. And I think that's also true for businesses. Right. Um, question from two and Ngoyen, I think, I'm sorry if I mangled your name. Um, do you know how the rate of business closures in Chinatown compares to the baseline of all businesses in New York City since the pandemic started? The, the xenophobic sentiment may have decreased demand at the beginning, but there's also been an increase in demand for local business. So what might the net effect be? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I don't think we have data on the entire state yet. But uh, or city, but based off of the comparisons of the Coco study, it seems like Chinatowns are experiencing much higher rates of uh, business closure than um, the Upper East Side or even East Harlem. So it does seem to be not necessarily um, completely um, related to whether you're a minority, because it's specifically these Chinese communities that are being affected uh, disproportionately when it comes to the food industry. But at the same time, that is just a study of food systems and it, it hasn't looked at other closures more broadly and that would definitely be really interesting to look at. And uh, we have one more, maybe this will be the last one. Let's see what else comes in. Um, so this is from Melanie Dupuy, who apparently worked with Dr. Imbrice on her manuscript. Um, she'd like to know, can you relate the concept of different types of network to the analysis of competition for those of us who don't have the background to understand how the two fit together? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the idea here is that we're thinking that, well, when I remember growing up um, in LA and going to Chinatown and visiting in the markets there, being really impressed at the diversity of different products that each vendor sold, but also confused about why there was, you know, specialism in some cases and, and really broad overlap in other cases. And I really just wanted, I was curious about how, how they were able to survive, right? All these small markets competing um, for, for a group of people's um, attention with relatively similar products, but, you know, having their own little niches as well within that space. And so uh, this kind of inspired the question of whether um, there is this competition between vendors that um, is at its base related to what types of products everyone is selling um, next to each other and um, how ultimately the reasons why they have those products um, to begin with is because they are connected to um, to distributors who themselves are connected to farms. And so there, there are constraints in the food supply chain in which those products are reaching the vendors. And so we're, we're hoping to link the, um, the competition between the vendors over different products um, for consumers to ultimately where those products um, are, are, are sourced from on farms, whether that means that 
Uh, it encourages, for example, um, the farms to diversify because they need to supply the demand of the vendors. Or does it mean that we get more, um, you know, monocultures that are more efficient and we can reduce costs? Like, how do those, how the, how do those two sort of forces balance out and ultimately impact the actual structure of the connections between producers, uh, vendors, and markets? Right. Thank you. Um... And I know I said that might be the last, but the questions just keep coming in. So let's continue the conversation. Um, from Edwin Schmidt, um, he's wondering if your team has used any qualitative ethnographic research, such as by participating directly in the logistic chains to triangulate the quantitative analysis. Um, and could a qualitative approach also be useful for developing more activist means for disseminating the results of your research to the community who to people who may benefit from learning about these, how these shocks are affecting Chinese American businesses. Yeah, absolutely. We are hoping, I mean, this project is just beginning and it's a big collaborative project with lots of, uh, of, of team members involved and um, qualitative work is definitely a part of that uh, design. And we do have work with, um, with community members that are actually engaging with uh, Chinatown members to talk about like there, there are a slew of different um, videos. If you look up like Dr. and Bruce's studies on the ground in Chinatown, videoing um, people in uh, vendors in their restaurants and their retail stores and how they have been impacted by Chinatown um, closures um, or, the, or the pandemic closures. And so that that's going to be a part of the um, collaboration. Um, we haven't exactly figured out how all of it's going to work together, but um, that's sort of the work in progress, um, putting those pieces together, which I think are extremely important to understanding like the motivations behind um, people's decisions and, and what they hope to do in the future. Yes, I hope the circumstances allow you to do all that kind of thing soon before too long. Um, and we have one question from William Teng, and he asks, how might the results be different among different Chinatowns, such as Lower Manhattan versus Flushing, and what could be the differentiating factors? Yeah, so that's related to one of the previous questions, uh, which asks question of like new immigration and how that um, might influence um, the results. And so Manhattan, is th this older this older community of Chinese immigrants uh, versus Flushing, which tends to, to um, be a newer suite of immigrants in, in New York. Um, and Flushing also, it's interesting when you compare those two um, Chinatowns because there's also de demographic differences, like different communities of um, Chinese immigrants coming um, to the area. So I think all of those things will, will influence the types of, um, products that they produce um, and sell. But I also think it's really interesting to look at other uh, ethnic communities and how they interact with Chinatowns because Chinatowns are not just for Chinese people. They um, are sources of uh, diverse cultural products for a variety of ethnicities in the US. And you see a lot of different communities coming to Chinatown and using um, Chinatown's um, markets to secure their cultural connections to food. Um, and so I think that you'll also find that different communities might um, interact with Manhattan, Chinatown and Flushing differently. And that's something we're, we're thinking of uh, looking at, but also thinking, um, you know, that New York is not uh, the only Chinatown that's interesting in the US. There's also the, the West Coast, which has, sort of different histories um, and lengths of time under exclusion acts that might be uh, differentially impacting um, the communities there as well. Yeah, I think you should study all the Chinatowns. <laughs> um, I think we are finally at the end of all the questions. So if nothing else pops up right now, then I'd just like to thank you for coming and talking to us. That was super interesting. We had a great discussion and it was a pleasure. So thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much.